Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to be getting started. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, we're going to be getting started here in a minute. Um, so I'm going to try to hold off on, as the questions come about, write them down and submit them into the chat down at the bottom. And then at the end, I'll try to get to as many of them as I, as I can. So let's, uh, let's start by uh, talking a little bit about what we're intending to do. And let me get there for a second. Okay. Um, do you see everything okay? Okay. So I'm uh, Dr. Roberto Garcia. Uh, the founder of uh, Contour Facial Plastic Surgery. And uh, I'm here with uh, my staff. You cannot see them. Um, but uh, we're, this is our first, hopefully, of a few webinars that we're going to do. You know, we've had to change things uh, in these crazy times because this is, this is how things are now. Everything's through webinar. And, and so with the Zoom application, it allows me to at least continue my passion of teaching and educating patients and those that are you know, wanting to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the services that we provide and, um, and how it is that uh, over the years that we've made this process a little bit more simple and a little bit more doable. Um, 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 and so, you know, that's, that's kind of been our, our goal. Uh, so, you know, at Contour Facial Plastic Surgery, if some of you haven't had a chance to come visit our new office, I'm proud to say that we opened February 15th and then we were forced to close March 15th <laughs> as luck would have it. But uh, many of you know me, I'm a man of faith. And so that's what's gotten us all through it. And we've been just fine. And so we open up next week. We have a, a significant backlog of surgeries uh, to get through, but uh, we'll take each patient one by one. And uh, as you know, our center is dedicated exclusively to the face. Uh, this is all I do, and um, I have uh, three primary uh, sections to my practice. I have myself that runs the surgical component. I have uh, Brooks Pittman who runs our um, our injectable practice, and then I have uh, Destin um, Bell who runs um, our um, skincare uh, section. So let's go through this slide. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of go through some basics, and so. We now know that plastic surgery is much more common than ever uh, for several reasons. Number one, it's less expensive. Um, patients are wanting to look better for professional reasons, and so individuals are staying in the workforce for longer. And I, and I pray that that continues to be, as uh, despite some of the job losses that we've seen in the um, in the recent uh, weeks. But uh, I, I, I do see that that's one of the principal reasons that we're seeing a lot more volume um, in our industry. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, individuals are staying active for longer periods of time in their life. And so we're finding that they want to feel good. Uh, they want to they look as good as they feel. And so, you know, where, when I was beginning my practice nearly uh, 15 years ago, uh, we found that the average age of somebody having surgery was probably in, um, you know, their early 50s. And now we have that almost that same personality of person of, of individual uh, in their 60s uh, seeking surgery. So we do know uh, that individuals are wanting to stay youthful uh, for uh, going later into their life. Um, you know, surgeries are up across the board. Uh, women's surgeries are up nearly 15%. Um, the male surgeries, believe it or not, are up uh, over 20%. And so that's a stark comparison to when I started my practice that, you know, you could count on your hand the number of men that were walking through our doors um, annually. And so now we see it quite frequently. So it's always good to see that as men are trying to stay more competitive and they're trying to stay in the workforce for longer. And they're com uh, competing with a lot of these younger uh, whippersnappers that are coming through. Um, the, uh, um, as, as I told you, I'm the founder of Contour Facial Plastic Surgery. I've been in practice for over 15 years. Um, and um, I've written uh, several books. The one on your left that you see is The Art of Facial Aesthetics, and that is our sixth version of the book. Um, and uh, we have, um, I've published several articles most recently. Uh, we published 
an article in a one of our textbooks, um, the um, clinics of facial plastic surgery, talking about some of our procedures that we do. Uh, I've uh, presented at international meetings in the past. I'm double board certified and I'm affiliated with several organizations, all uh, dedicated to the face, head and neck. We have primarily two locations. Uh, our main office is in Ponte Vedra. I, I like to call our, our mothership. And then we have another office in St. Augustine uh, where we uh, perform mostly injections and skincare uh, treatments. Um, give me one second because I'll need to check this chat thing here. Somebody just sent something to me and the Q&A thing is still on, Amy. Is that, is that uh, okay. All right, so let me just check something real quick. I don't know how to, the chat. Give me one second, everybody, sorry. Is that over here? Okay, there we go. Um, it's not here. Oh, chat, okay. And then let's just, all panelists, is that what you want? All panelists and attendees, okay. All right, so there you guys can ask questions now. Um, okay, so, and again, uh, I only, as you know, I, I only specialize in faces. So let's get to the nuts and bolts of this. And so what is our biggest fear? For years, everybody's biggest fear, at least uh, what I've told is, Dr. Garcia, please, I do not want to look plastic. I do not want to look windblown. I don't want to look like somebody that I'm not. And so on your screen, you'll see an individual. Her name is Jocelyn Wildenstein, and she, uh, she really... Um, she went overboard, I think, and she became uh, what she aspired uh, to be, and that was the cat woman. And you might have seen her on the news uh, years ago. And this is this, uh, this individual had far too many surgeries. And so in my quest for knowledge, I tried to see how close she came to being a cat. And you can see that there's actually quite a resemblance. So, you know, all of us here in this room know that that probably isn't the, the most natural of appearances. And while we want to see a difference, we, won't, we don't want to see a change of who we are. So how do we avoid that? You know, we break the, the aging face component down into three principal parts. Uh, something's aging the skin, there's something aging the face due to gravity, and then of course there's something aging the face due to volume loss. And so we're focusing today mostly on the gravitational components and some of the volume loss components. And so we're first gonna talk a little bit about gravity. and How is it that the face is affected due to gravity? So this is a classic example of an aging face that I see pretty commonly. And so you're seeing that there's three components to the face. And so I break it down in three areas. From the hairline to the brow is the upper third. From the brow, to the jawline is the middle third, and then from the jawline down to the clavicles or the upper chest inlet is the lower third. And so each one of those areas ages completely independent. So we'll first look at the upper third of the face, and we know that this is the only part of the human face that ages purely vertical, okay? So if you look at positions of brows over time, how they've changed, and you might wanna go back and look at pictures of yourself years ago, and you'll find that the brows do change significantly from a nice arched position. And so when I was in my fellowship, we studied a, a substantial group of, um, of supermodels and we looked at the, where was the brow position in these patients? And we found that you wanna see a nice arch to the brow uh, lying about, a, about three quarters of a centimeter above the bony component of the rim. So if you push on your bone, you wanna see that brow about three quarters of a centimeter above it. Secondly, you want to see the arch point of the brow on a vertical axis of where the brown or the colored part of your eye turns to white, and that's an area that we call the lateral limbus. And so what happens is the brow changes from this nice arched position to first manifesting laterally here, and so it begins to drop on the outsides. And so a lot of individuals try to compensate, and they start plucking out here on the edge in order to kind of give the appearance that the brow might not have dropped as substantially. And then over time, you see that the brow begins to drop in the middle component, and finally, it drops centrally, and you almost see that the head of the brow, which is what we consider this area here, begins to drop below the level of the orbital rim, and it gives a little bit more of that stern appearance. So when we're doing any kind of procedure, albeit uh, Botox procedures, or what we call the chemical brow lift, 
or the actual surgical brow lift, we're doing nothing more than counteracting the effects of the normal descent of the brow. So if the brows have dropped vertically, we are simply lifting vertically. Now, the techniques that are, that are utilized is probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but just to know that the basic concept is that you are raising the brow in an opposite direction to how the brow had aged originally. Now, when you look at the mid face, what do we see? Back in the old days, they used to think the face aged straight towards the nose. And that's what prompted a lot of surgeons early on in the process to pull straight back to where you look like you, well, you stuck your head out of a car going at 90 miles an hour. So the classic windblown look was caused by that inappropriate understanding of how the mid face aged. And it wasn't until the late 90s or the 2000s that we actually found that the face is aging down and in, so it's falling towards the mouth. And so from there, we gleaned, okay, if the face is falling, in, in, indeed falling in that direction, why don't we just lift opposite to that? And so we lift opposite to this arrow. So we're going in this direction. So it's more of an up and out direction, okay? That's phase two. The final component is the neck. And so what's happened over time? You recall that early on, I talked to you about the three components, skin, uh, gravity, and volume being what's aging the face. Well, if you look at skin issues, it's primarily collagen loss, okay? And it's collagen that's holding these two bands in the neck together. And you can see the band, one band here and another band here. So over time, they begin to pull apart and you see these discernible edges. So what we do is we actually put those bands back together, redrape everything, and it looks really natural. And uh, you don't look like you have surgery. And so um, the, that was how we treated it forever. Everything was lifting, everything was skincare issues, but there was something missing. And so, you know, thankfully my, as many things in my life, uh, I can thank my wife or my family or my sister or somebody in my, um, and has give, gives me these eureka moments. And I found out something. I took this picture years ago and I saw as I was driving home from a Christmas dinner, that the face flipped. And what I mean by that is a youthful face has what we now know as an inverted triangle where the top part is heavy, the bottom part narrows. And that's all defined upon the, pre the assumption that there's a significant amount of volume in the upper third of the face that creates two arches. Number one, it creates the temple arch. And then the second one is it creates a projecting arch of the cheek so it's two arches one here one like this if you can if you can understand the three-dimensionality of this but on top of that what truly creates the inverted triangle or some people call the heart shape is the narrowing as we move down towards the jawline now in an aged face the absolute opposite occurs you get heavy down here and you narrow up at the top so you become a true triangle and you can see that in my beautiful mother who has, a, she has good volume here, but you can see that she's beginning to narrow in here and she's beginning to widen in here. And so we from there said, okay, well, let's look a little bit deeper and let's look into the volume loss component of the face. So here I've, 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 I have three schematics of a young person, a middle-aged person and an elderly person. And so what we're looking at is how does this triangle go from an inverted solid heart-shaped face to the flip. And so when you look at the actual fat pockets of the face, we know, and I'll get into this in the slide in just a moment, what causes changes in fat, what, what causes changes in, in the volumization of the face. And so we know that as one ages, not only are we having gravitational descent, we're also having fat loss in the face. And that uh, is what truly changed the way we looked at aging faces, okay? So you began to get that gaunt appearance and that hollowed appearance. Um, and you compound that with normal gravitational effects and guess what happens? You, you completely flip the face. And so at the same time, we looked at, okay, so if we're looking, if what we can see is a significant change on the surface, what's actually happening underneath 
due to volume loss. And like many times in life, what's underneath is what really is the culprit. So let's look at this, um, this simple graph that I drew up, kind of archaic, but it represents what we've been proposing over the course of the last 10 years. And so here in this mid area here, when a woman enters into the perimenopausal years, we will begin to see changes in the volumization of the face. And so why is that? Well, what we found is that estrogen is the key supplier and maintainer of fat within the face. And I, and I, and I wanna make a, a, a distinction here, not just estrogen, but uh, endogenous extra, estrogen, so your own estrogen. If you start throwing exogenous estrogen uh, or uh, you know, Premarin, Prempro, and things like that, that many of you may be on, you're not going to see the same maintenance of volume uh, that you would see in a premenopausal person. And so we know that this time frame here between the mid 40s to the mid 50s, roughly a 10 year span, is when we see the estrogen drop, which is the blue line. And then we see fat volume, which is this gray line. And you can see that it clearly descends. And this is our critical period that we need to resupplant fat into the face. And so I took this patient who was a classic example of skin issues, gravitational issues, and volume loss issues. And I said, okay, let me schematize the volume loss within her face. And I said, okay, this is probably what she looks like before. And then I said, okay, where do I want to get her to? And so I said, okay, here we are again with her before. Volume loss, you see the classic signs of cheek loss. The temples are beginning to waste. And in this region here that we call the tear trough is also beginning to flatten out. So I said, okay, I want to get her to that. I want to get that volume back into those cheeks. I want to reestablish that cheek volume. And I want to get those eyes popping again. And the way that I do that is by creating those two arcs that we talked about earlier. And so I said, okay, so here's our ultimate goal. This is what I see underneath. This is, I, this is what I see as her goal of what I want underneath her skin. And so we put volume back in the face along with tightening of the jawline and we're able to achieve um, a more youthful appearance where we not only have given volume into the tear trough region and in the cheeks and tightened up the jawline, um, we've uh, given a nice natural appearance to the upper third. And the overall appearance, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that she doesn't look like she was operated upon. She looks like she's refreshed, less stern. Um, and these are words of hers, not mine. Um, that I no longer have people asking me, what am I angry about? So that to me was a pretty classic example of, of treating those uh, couple things together. So um, I want to briefly talk about some of the non-surgical options. You know, again, very brief. Uh, but these are things that more Brooks and my uh, esthetician uh, uh, would be recommending for you. But there are ways to stimulate collagen uh, with our, our microneedling uh, technology, we now have stepped up the microneedling concept where originally it was just collagen induction therapy alone. And then we started adding in um, synthetic growth factors. Um, now we actually use your own plasma and it's something called PRP or platelet rich plasma. And we have found uh, uh, pr pretty, uh, pretty nice results in terms of uh, stimulating uh, collagen levels within the skin, thickening the skin and helping with fine lines and discolorations. And so um, many of you know about a lot of these injectables. I'm not gonna bore you and get into it. This could be a whole talk in and of itself. But again, chemical peels and lasers are something that we offer for some of these skin issues. You know, and I do have some patients that have those isolated fat pockets underneath the neck, um, typically younger patients um, who we have found that some of the uh, injectable non-surgical, what we call the Kybella treatment, where in essence, uh, you're injecting something in the fat pocket because it helps dissolve the fat. Uh, it's very effective. It usually takes two or three treatments, but it's a good non-surgical option for isolated fat pockets 
uh, in the neck region. And then, you know, Miracu uh, PDO threads, um, uh, just the, we, I, I say Miracu, that's just the, the name of the company that we use, but PDO threads, polydeoxinone threads have been around for a while. Um, and we use them as a stimulator of collagen and we use them as a means to uh, build collagen within tissues. And it does also provide somewhat of a lifting uh, technique as well. And uh, we talked about the PRP treatment. So let's get into some of our surgical options. And so, you know, I'm going to focus mostly on fat grafting and some of these surgical procedures here that we see at the bottom. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go through each one and kind of escalate the treatments up. And uh, we're going to start with this lady who, excuse me, um, classic signs of uh, aging in the mid face, volume loss in the mid face, causing almost a deflation of the balloon of the mid face, causing deepening of folds. She had some looseness of her upper eyelids. So we did volume to her mid face and uh, around her folds and her eyes. And you can see a uh, significant change in the mid face. And again, by removing some of the skin off of the upper eyelids, um, we are able to clean up the mid face and she looks uh, very natural afterwards. And uh, I wanna comment that this picture on the left uh, was taken um, uh, not too early in the day. So it's not like we were pulling her out of bed. This was how she looked a lot of times. And, that, and that's what prompted her to come in. So, um, Here's another example, really good example of classically back in the old days, I would have come and I would have removed a lot of fat under the eyes, right? And so what did that do? It, when we did that, that caused further hollowing in the future. And so what we do now is kind of a combination of things where we might remove a little fat here but then we're really focusing on putting volume down below. And so you can make a remarkable difference just by correcting the tear trough region and, and replacing that fat back into the mid face. And so afterwards you can see a nice gentle appearance to the, to the mid face. You soften those folds. And again, they look very, very natural. And, you know, again, another example here of being conservative with fat pocket, remove just a little bit of fat, but mostly built underneath. And that's critical. And if you look here in this hollow area right in here, you're going to see a significant uh, hollowing to the tear trough. Excuse me a second. Am I delayed? No? Okay. Um, what, what do you want me to say? Okay. Okay, so if any of you have a question, you, you'll probably need to log off and then log back in uh, to ask a question under the Q&A section. Uh, not chat, the Q&A section, okay? So it's the Q&A section is what you need. Sorry about that. Um, we'll, we'll keep going. This is our first one, so we're kind of learning. Bear with us. Anyway, um, okay, so a good example. Young man um, from Duke University. He, uh, uh, endodontist, really didn't like the asymmetry of his upper eyelids, right? More over here than here. Hollowing here. Well, he first came in because he thought he had these fat pockets underneath his eyes. And so I said, well, you know, it's not so much fat, it's more of hollowing. And he had something called a negative vector, which means that your eye is in front of your cheeks. So looking from the side, you look almost bug-eyed. And so we needed to build his cheek back up. And so afterwards, you can see the, a pretty remarkable difference that you can see by, you know, make it, having the upper eyelid creases more even, his eyes are more open, and more importantly, um, we built this here. And so if you notice something interesting, here it looked like he was really drawn in the midface. Okay, here, I got a close-up. This is a good it looked like he was really drawn in the mid face and now the eyelid complex looks more solid, more stable. So that's kind of what we're after and, and really building in this area here and filling in here. So uh, he was, he was quite happy. And so um, here's an example where we treated several components, some skin issues. We treated with a chemical peel, some gravitational issues. So we were looking at the neck issues. We were looking at uh, the eyelids, and then of course we were looking at volume loss 
due to uh, some hollowing that we saw here in the eye. So we kind of treated all three things in little amounts. And uh, so afterwards, you can see that she has a nice established uh, jawline. Uh, the neck is cleaner. The cheeks are higher and that's, that's good because now, pardon me, now all of a sudden you've created one of those arches, okay? And that, remember, creates a three-dimensional path into the eyes. And remember, all we're trying to do is take attention to the eyes, which is the most appealing part of, um, of the human face. So um, that, was a, uh, that was a good uh, example of that. And then on frontal view, you'll see how much just doesn't look like she had anything done, looks refreshed. And so that's gonna be, con be a constant theme in our practice, that our patients never look like they had something done, they just look refreshed. So that's all I want from my patients. All right, and here, um, lady wanted to have uh, something done with her eyelids, and then again, the fullness in the neck, the beginnings of the jowling, and so we were able to help with the jowls, give her nice uh, streamlined jawline, uh, clean up around the eyes a little bit, looks really refreshed, really natural. Um, more of an extreme example um, of the neck, and you can see here just by bringing up the jawline in the neck, uh, you probably have a tiny bit of posturing in this picture here where she's probably maybe sucking in just a scotch, but um, I think you can, outside of that, you can see the clear difference in uh, the jawline and you can't mistake that. Um, so she was very happy. And again, you see here the cheeks and she basically looks like herself, simply uh, a younger version. So that's, that's, that's good. Um, uh, this lady uh, who uh, was the director of marketing for uh, Dale Earnhardt, <laughs> nicest lady in the world. And she, uh, she was tired of um, uh, looking angry. She was a very sweet lady. She wanted to refresh herself. So we looked at, okay, how are we going to open up? She had these really nice green eyes. You could not see them because not enough light was getting into them. Um, I thought she was a little flattened in here, which you'll see in, the, in, in a picture in a moment. And then of course, uh, some fullness around the neck and um, uh, some of the skin issues. So we did some fat grafting and we cleaned up around the eyes. We raised the brows, tightened the jawline. And um, we uh, then on the profile view, you can see here what I was talking about with this flattened cheek, okay? And you can almost see this streak right here. That is a, uh, a distinction between one fat pocket and the next. So they don't always fall or uh, recess at the same time they go in one recesses a little bit more than the other. So it's a fluid process that's going on, but you can see the hollowing in here while you still have a little bit of volume right in here. So we corrected that, we made it more even, and you can see that we have more of a solid cheek that now extends into the zygomatic area and into the temple, right? So it becomes a nice smooth sweep into the temple and it blends into the upper third of the face. So that's, um, that's ultimately what you want. So a couple of years ago, uh, I, I, got, I, I had this constant thing in my head of, okay, so we've been doing these lifts for years. Uh, patients are loving it. But man, we got to come up with something that's a little bit shorter recovery, can be done under a little bit less anesthesia. So we created the Contour Lift, which was focused primarily on the jawline. Um, and sometimes I would extend it into the neck. Uh, but the idea was you get pretty quick recovery. It'll turn the clock back eight to 10 years um, and uh, you can get a significant change. And so this was an example. Uh, I want to highlight this example to show the brevity. And so this lady came to us for consult on January 5th. And then, so she had classic signs of fullness in the neck, the jowling. She also wanted me to do something with her upper eyelids. The caveat was she had a wedding to get to by the end of the month. And so she really wanted to look good because her husband's ex-wife was going to be there. And it was just big convoluted thing that somehow I got caught into the middle of it. And I said, okay, fine, let's see if we can push the surgery and get you on the book sooner. So we did. And um, okay, so here's her uh, oblique angle. And you can see she really has virtually no jawline. Okay, it's completely obliterated. And so we did, um, we did surgery on the 12th. So we, we were able to get her in for surgery on a week later. We did her follow-up 11 days after surgery, okay? This was her at her follow-up. Okay, so she had some mild bruising here. 
Eyes were more open, still a little bit of swelling up here. Her jawline looked much better. Um, her profile, you can see now she's beginning to get a jawline, even just at 11 days with this procedure. Uh, she did really well with covering up makeup for the, you know, for some of the redness of the incisions and whatnot. And so that was the 23rd. So then she went to a wedding five days later, okay? And look at this. This is pretty neat. There she is. So from time of surgery, which was, what was it, the 12th? The 12th. Mm -hmm. to, the, to the wedding was 16 days. And you see the husband's face. He's got a smile from ear to ear because his current wife looks better than his ex-wife. And everybody was happy, uh, including uh, myself. So that was a, a, a very nice story. Very sweet look. Anyway, um, so here you see uh, comparison side by side. Again, this is simply 11 days after surgery um, that she came for her follow-up for her suture removal. And there you go, um, her profile. So, um, and, you know, and, and you can see this uh, time and time again with this procedure, right? You can see a nice tightening of the jawline. You, you get some significant improvement in the neck. And, uh, you know, on, on angled views, you, you know, look at that. You, you, this is a procedure that gives you a recovery of 10 days, 11 days, 12 days. And you can see a significant difference. And so, um, and here's a younger person who we did only the cheek, okay? No incisions in the neck, but you can see the difference that we can make in the neck uh, just by lifting everything from back here. And I believe this picture is two weeks so that you see how individuals can look even in a, in a very short recovery period. She worked for FEMA. She needed to get back to work. Uh, this was over uh, last summer. So um, that's a pretty, that's pretty uh, typical. Um, I think I'm kind of coming to a conclusion here of, um, of, of the presentation, but I do want to take a moment. I may not be able to get to everybody's questions, right? Um, yeah, so log off. If you can't get your question through, log off and then log back in, go under Q&A and ask the question, but I'll try to get, see if I can get to some of these questions here. Uh, okay, so we have a few. Somebody asked a question where we're located. We're in Ponte Vedra. And our main, office, uh, our main office is in Ponte Vedra, and we have our second uh, office in St. Augustine, but I see patients in uh, Ponte Vedra. Um, you know about vertical lines going from the inside of the eyebrow up to the forehead. So most times vertical lines in the forehead in this area here are a result of either volume loss or overactive brows. And so if it's a matter of overactive brows, you can either do Botox, um, or, you know, a lot of times during a brow lift, I'll remove them. But if you still have residual lines, even if after you've had a brow lift, uh, a lot of times we can put either fat or we can put a filler in those lines to help fill them in. Um, so yeah, what's the recovery for a contour lift? Uh, usually the recovery for a contour lift is anywhere from 10 to 14 days. And, um, we have, um, um, we do have, uh, and we do see our patients, within 10 to 14 days are pretty much back uh, to it. Also, I get a question about what can be done for the marionette lines. Now, the marionette lines, by definition, are the lines that extend from the corner of the mouth uh, all the way down to the bottom of the jawline. Okay, so the marionette lines, if you think about it, let me go back here for a second because I want to show you something. And I can show you where the marionettes come from so you get a better understanding. Um, here, where's that lady? It's be good. The marionettes are a result of volume a volume loss and B uh, gradual descent of the jawline. So here we are with what the marionette line is, which is this distance here from the corner of the mouth down to the edge of the jawline. And it's really a result of the weight of this tissue here. And so what happens interestingly is this tissue right here begins to descend medially and it stops right here. There's a wall of ligaments that extends from the bone all the way out to the skin. And so when it stops here, it's forced to now move downward. And that's what creates the jowls, this tissue here. And so in reality, the term jowl uh, means broken jawline because it looks like there's a step off here in the jawline. And so you can almost see that there's no definition to the jawline. When you do a lift, you are addressing two components in the mid face. You are addressing the jowls because you're lifting up in this direction. And you're addressing the marionette lines because they're a result of these jowls and the weight of these jowls. So that's how you get the marionette lines resolved.
All right, so I recommend that you send questions uh, to info at contora.com. Again, that's info, I-N-F-O, at contora.com. You know, if you want to call our office, our phone number, uh, 904-686-8020. Yeah, and, oh yeah, and we're, we're, we're back to being open on Monday. Um, this, uh, we've, uh, we've gotten the okay from the governor, so we are good to go. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. So thanks very much, everybody. I, I apologize that uh, we had this little snafu here at the end with the questions, but, uh, hopefully this will be something that we'll do again. I wish you all the best and I look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon. Okay. Um, okay. Bye.